Hello, ladies and gentlemen in the international community. My name is Pamela Seaton. I am a public lecturer, speaker, and moderator. Currently, I am also a moderator to a current events senior group. I have been lecturing recently on the topics of the emergence of Brazil, Russia, India, and China in the global economy, as well as U.S.-China economic competition in Africa. Currently, I am lecturing on Turkey and beyond. Upcoming lectures will be on the history, culture, and society of New Orleans, Haiti, past and present, the global face-off, BRIC versus G7, and the age of the Moors in Southern Europe. I welcome you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the lecture video. Thank you for joining the lecture. Publicly condemned it, supported, supported the United Nations resolution demanding withdrawal, Israel's return to the 1949 armistice lines, and for a United Nations emergency force to be stationed in the Sinai. Okay, by the end of December of the same year, the British and French forces had totally withdrawn from Egyptian territory after additional UN resolutions pressure and intense US pressure. So the US got uh, them out of there. March 8, 1957, Israel completed its withdrawal on March 8, 1957. April 8, 1957, the Suez was reopened. So this is, so it took almost a year to get the Suez Canal um, open. So we get on with Anwar Sadat. I thought I would take a time photo of Anwar Sadat. Does anybody remember, I know you all remember Anwar Sadat because it was recent. Any thoughts, any reflections? Any reflections on Anwar Sadat at this point in time? For sure. <laughs> I said that. <laughs> Yeah, but he was, he was uh, very, very gutsy, I think. Very gutsy to do what he did. Yeah. It caused his assassination. Any other thoughts on Anne Horstadon? Any thoughts, Sue? He was pro-Western, wasn't he? Oh, uh, yes. Very, became very pro-Western because of the fact that uh, he had to move to our camp because everything was broken down after the 1973 October War, the Yom Kippur uh, invasion. So he really, really had to. He had to. He had to move with us, um, and he he pretty much uh, really took a bold step, diplomatic step. But actually, it was um, Menachem Begin who um, basically. It was Menachem Begin who basically um, pretty much um, managed to get him an invitation. Menachem Begin invited him to uh, Israel in 19, 15, 1978, around that time or before, uh, maybe 1977, and, it, 77, and invited him uh, for a meeting. So they had to do something. But well, he's the one that initiated it, though. Um, it was Menachem Begin. Well, it was that initiated. I think it was Menachem Begin, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it was, there was a, you know, tentative. They, they were trying to get a detent or something. And, and he said he'd like to, to see, he'd like to go and visit Knesset. And that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. He, I know he went to Egypt and met with Menachem Begin before the Camp David Accords. The Camp David Accords, where they, they, they started getting together the framework of this peace treaty. And so that occurred in early 1978, um, or September, it may have occurred September of 1978. The peace, the, the Middle East Peace Treaty was signed in March 1979. So this is what occurred, and they both um, shared the Nobel Prize for this um, Middle Eastern Peace Treaty um, signing after the Middle Eastern Peace Treaty. So, <laughs> so Sadat took a bold move. He had no other choice. Economically, his country was in ruin. 
They had nothing. Everything was broken down. He had to, he had to get, start getting real money into the country. The Soviets were there, but they, they were a basket case, basically. I mean, the Soviets were spending most of their, their money, their hard currency, on military um, weaponry, yeah. a military-industrial complex. So, so he, had to, he had to do something. He had to do something. So he, he did it. And so, any other thoughts on Anwar uh, Sadat? Well, he and Begin had a similar history. I mean, that's kind of why they could do that. I mean, Begin was, he was a, you know, rebel, a nationalist, a gunfighter. So was Sadat. Sadat. Yeah, during World War II, you know, he was with the Nazis. And so they could, they both could do that. I mean, so. They had a common background. Right. So, all right, so Sadat pretty much served less time as president than um, Jamal Abdul Nasser. Uh, Sadat was the third president of Egypt, serving from October 1970 until his assassination by fundamentalist army officers, October 1981. He was a senior member of the Free Officers Group that overthrew the Muhammad Ali dynasty in the Egyptian Revolution of 1952. He was a close confidant of President Gamal Abdel Nasser, who he succeeded as president in 1970. He led the Yom Kippur War of 1973 against Israel, making him a hero in Egypt and for a time throughout the Arab world. Only for a brief moment, though, about five years. Afterwards, he engaged in negotiations with Israel, culminating in the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty. This won him the Nobel Peace Prize, but also made him unpopular among some Arabs and resulted in a temporary suspension of Egypt's membership in the Arab League. Okay, Anwar Sadat. Okay, March 26, 1979. The Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty was signed by Anwar Sadat and Israel Prime Minister Menachem Begin in Washington, D.C. Following, and this, this peace treaty, as I said, followed the meetings, the Camp David meetings with Jimmy Carter, uh, President Sadat, and Prime Minister Menachem Begin. And, uh, and, and so this came forth. As I said, both Sadat and Begin were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for creating the treaty. Islamists were outraged and enraged by Sadat's Sinai treaty with Israel, particularly the radical Egyptian Islamic Jihad. And we're going to spend time on the Islamic, Islam, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. So make a note of that. We're coming to that later on. According to interviews and information gathered by journalist Lawrence Wright, the group was recruiting military officers and accumulating weapons, waiting for the right moment to launch a complete overthrow of the existing order in Egypt. And it did happen, but it was a bloody um, assassination. Okay. Egypt is considered one of the United States. Okay, we're going, moving on to U.S.-Egypt relations. Egypt is considered one of the United States' strongest allies in the Middle East and Arab world. This is not always the case of the U.S.-Egypt relations. During the 50s and 60s, three issues colored the American view of its relationship with Egypt as follows. The Cold War, Arab nationalism, and Israel as a strategic ally of the United States. So these were the things that, that kept, these were the three things that kept the U.S. and Egypt from having good relations early on. President Nasser initially favored a non-aligned approach and asked the United States for military support. Egypt turned to the Soviets who supplied Egypt with weapons when the U.S. denied Nasser's request for military support. Of course, this pushed Egypt closer to the Soviet camp. And this occurred during the President Nasser's era and President Sadat's era was when we saw um, Egypt had a relationship 
with the Soviet Union, and this was all during the Cold War era. This combined with U.S. fear of NASA's Arab nationalism led the United States to work toward undermining the Egyptian regime. It really didn't happen, though. We tried to undermine it. Even during the um, assassination attempt on Sadat, we wanted to foil that. We had 100 CIA agents in there before October 6, 1981, but they could not foil that assassination attempt uh, on Sadat. Um, Anwar, Anwar Sadat actively worked to move Egypt closer to the United States, and Egyptian-American relations gradually improved. This rapprochement was symbolized by Sadat asking the Soviet military advisors to leave. So once he asked the Soviet advisors to leave, that's when the U.S. The US and Egypt became very close and began to, to foment a very close relationship. Then um, U.S. President Richard Nixon requested Congress to authorize $250 million in aid to Egypt.